Hey, all right, we're live. Uh, well, thank you, Tim, and thank you for uh, the PDX Ruby Brigade for this awesome evening. I uh, actually came for the first time this January, uh, so we, here we are just a few months later, and i um, very excited to be able to give a presentation. So um, I just want to encourage you, if you're new, that yeah, this, this group is friendly and, and rocking, so uh, you know, if, if you think, you know, Oh my gosh, I'm new here, and all these people have been here forever doing all this stuff. Well, I'm still kind of new here, so, so there you go. So it's a, it's a great group. And um, I have uh, one question before we really get into it. Um, quick show of hands, who considers themselves basically a full stack developer? Uh, go ahead and raise your hand. All right, a few people. Well, how many of you consider yourself primarily a front-end developer? Couple people. <laughs> How many of you consider yourself primarily a back-end developer? A lot of people. Well, that kind of makes sense because we're, we're, we're here in a Ruby group. Uh, today's talk will be pretty, pretty focused on front-end stuff, but I think even if you're primarily a back-end developer, uh, it'll, it'll still be pretty interesting. And, yeah, a lot of this stuff is sort of about the future of Rails as a, as a framework and an ecosystem. So if you do a lot of work with Rails, you know, this, this stuff plays into it. Uh, so my name is Jared White. I'll uh, tell you just a little bit about myself in a moment. But first, I just want to say uh, Rails 5 plus Yarn plus Webpack plus Stimulus equals equals. I love front-end development. <laughs> I really do. I've been enjoying it a lot more uh, probably than I ever have, to be honest. <laughs> um, part of that's because uh, ES6 and the, the sort of recent developments in JavaScript uh, are, are pretty awesome. Uh, so the language is getting better, but the tooling is getting better, finally. <laughs> uh, and Rails is embracing a lot of the better tooling that's starting to come around. Uh, so we have a lot of fun stuff to dive into here. Uh, so uh, it's taken a while to get to the point where it feels kind of awesome. Um, so I might say it's taken too long. Um, so let's just let's just take a little trip down memory lane for a moment. Uh, a brief history of the Rails spread. Uh, so if you remember, if you were around back in the Rails three days and prior, uh, there wasn't any asset pipeline. There, there really wasn't any tooling around the front end development story. Uh, it was just stick a bunch of files in public and you're done. Um, so that, you know, it, it didn't really afford any of the stuff that we now take for granted, like being able to use different languages that compile the JavaScript, like CoffeeScript. Um, SAS, uh, fingerprinting for cache busting purposes, all this different stuff just wasn't there. Uh, so Rails 3.1, that was a pretty big deal when the ASCII pipeline came along. We got SAS, we got CoffeeScript. Uh, I actually never got into CoffeeScript. <laughs> uh, I think a few people maybe didn't, but other people did and loved it. And um, it was a good thing because some of the stuff in ES6 and beyond came kind of out of nice things that were available in CoffeeScript. Um, then we get to Rails 4, and the big release thing there for front-end developers was turbolanes. Yeah! Yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> uh, that kind of fell flat a bit, but um, I'm actually a big fan of, of the concept that turbolanes came out of, which uh, historically was called PJAX. It's this idea that, you know, instead of rendering a new page with an entirely new request in the browser. You just you know, get a chunk of HTML, you just swap out the HTML that's in your browser already, and you know, it's, it's way faster, uh, it's you know, near instantaneous uh, you know, if, if the request is pretty fast. Um, I think Turbolinks sort of oversold itself, and that actually made it seem less useful than it was. So that's just my personal opinion. I, I think there, there was a lot of value to it. Uh, but then we get to Rails 5. So this is now uh, like five years after the asset pipeline comes along. Uh, and all we really get as 
of exciting new front end things, active cable on a newer version of Turbolinks. And I really like Turbolinks 5. I encourage you to, to try it out a little bit if you haven't already. Um, but still, it kind of feels like at this point, like, shouldn't there be something more to the story here? Like, everyone's kind of moving on to whatever the latest office is, Angular and React, there's all these different things. And, and it kind of feels like that's where all the all the, the energy and focus is happening in, in the web space. And you know, question kind of becomes, well, what does Rails do? Is it just going to end up being kind of this um, back end API and everything exciting is on the front end? And like, how how do we how do we do this thing called developing a web application? Uh, so then we get to Rails 5.1, and I feel like this is the release that is like, wow. Like finally, mind blown. We get Yarn support with NPM modules, Webpack integration, support for Butte, uh, Vue.js, React. Um, the the jQuery dependency has been removed for Rails own unobtrusive JavaScript code, so that's the middle JavaScript now. So there's, uh, you know, it's a lighter weight there. So you can kind of use whatever JavaScript framework or set of libraries of choice you want. Uh, all this configuration possibility. So that was really a big deal, um, a, a big release. And you know, here we are basically a year later. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, as, as big as it was, I'm not sure everyone realizes how big it was. <laughs> so that's basically what I want to do tonight is kind of explain to you, like, here's all the goodies we have. Here's some of the reasons this is so awesome. And, you know, let's go yay for, for the the amazing contributors in the, in the Rails project for you know, making this happen. And then finally, um, as sort of a, a capstone over everything, is uh, this new thing called Stimulus. And Stimulus is not part of Rails. It's, it's its own project. It doesn't have to be used with Rails. It can be used with any kind of backend service infrastructure. Uh, but it is from the base camp folks. So it's clearly you know, their take on, here's how we can take Rails, and here's how we can add a lot of front end acti uh, interactivity and dy dynamism. Uh, and, and I think it's really cool. So, so we'll take a look at that. So first we'll talk about Yarn. Then we'll talk about Webpack and the Webpack gem, And then we'll talk about Stimulus. But first, a little bit about me. I've been a web developer since 1997. <laughs> if you can believe that, I was actually a teenager. So, yeah, it's it's been my life basically doing web stuff. Uh, Rails developer since 2006. Um, I came from the PHP world before that. Um, kind of, I think, uh, rode rode the wave there as far as I felt like I wanted to, and then the siren song of Rails and all the amazing stuff you could do with that all to me. So I, I uh, jumped ship and been doing that ever since. Uh, a company called White Fusion, where I'm the chief of exciting onboarding. Yeah, I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I do Rails application development and web design full time. Uh, I have a personal site that's powered by Jekyll, which is awesome Ruby based. Um, open source static site generator. So uh, you know, that's powering jackwhite.com. Uh, and if you have any questions about Jekyll and, and how to be a Ruby programmer and also do some really cool website stuff that's not necessarily applications, um, please talk to me because I'm, I'm very much a Jekyll evangelist at this point. Uh, I love to write. I write software. I write music. I write blog articles. I really appreciated something DHH said a couple years ago about being a software writer. That really resonated with me because I feel like um, I've come to, to the, the point in my life where I've realized that I don't have to have software be in this completely separate box from something artistic like music making or, or writing an essay or something. Um, it's all part of this thing called human expression. And, you know, putting our heart and soul into building something, and creating something, and making something, and putting it out there. So, uh, so I encourage you, you know, if you feel like you sometimes have a disconnect between your creative side and your programming side, uh, there's a way to synthesize it together. Um, and I primarily work as a freelancer, and I do 
have uh, some availability. If you have any projects, you can talk to me. Whoops. Okay, well, enough about me. <laughs> Let's move on to yarn. So, what is yarn? Uh, it's the thread that ties it all together. <laughs> uh, okay, so yarn is to npm asterisk. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, what well, Bundler is to Ruby gems. So if you look at it, it really is a very close uh, analogy. Uh, you have a gem file with Bundler, you have a package.json for yarn, and also npm uses that as well. You have gem file.lock, and you have yarn.lock, and they do very similar things. You know, the, the, the package level, you know, package.json uh, has, you know, I want this package, I want this package, I want this package, and couple develop, development dependencies that you know, it's just part of my development environment. Uh, and then what Yarn does is it will then you know, bake that into a lock file where all the versions and all the dependency graphs and all these different packages and their dependencies, all this stuff is all kind of baked in there. So the nice thing, uh, nice thing about that is if you hand your project off to another developer, they can just say Yarn install and poof. All the front end packages, all the JavaScript libraries, the frameworks, everything, you know, CSS libraries, like whatever you can think of, it just downloads in one fell swoop and you're done. Uh, command line interface is as you'd expect, it's very simple. Um, it's actually kind of nicer than Bundler in a way because you could just say yarn add moment or whatever your package name is and it'll update the package.json file automatically. So, um, yeah, it's great. Upgrade packages, remove packages. Um, now the asterisk there is because npm is itself a package manager. So all these npm modules that are out there are you know, they exist because of npm, and npm stands for node package manager. So then the question is, well, why do we need yarn if npm is a package manager? And the answer is that yarn is just a lot nicer. <laughs> it's it's kind of like Rubyists took the NPM ideas and refined a lot of it, and made it more like Bundler, and made it better, basically. <laughs> um, so now we, we get to work with Yarn. So if you've used NPM before and done things like NPM install whatever, or you know, NPM install if you already have a, a package.json file, um, switching over to Yarn and using that instead will be very easy and feel very familiar to you and, and be a little bit nicer. Uh, so under the hood, basically what's happening is when you add a new package to the yarn, it updates that package.json, the yarn.lock, it installs the package into a node modules folder. And so that will live in your Rails folder. So along with app and config and everything, you'll have node uh, modules. Uh, all those packages will be available to use through Webpack, which we'll get to in a moment. And the really nice thing is, uh, because of this new Webpacker integration, <coughs> Uh, anytime you do Rails, or in the old days if you rake uh, assets pre-compile, um, Yarn will install anything that hasn't been installed already. You know, so if things have been updated and then you, know, you need to pre-compile your assets, everything's going to be updated and installed and then everything will be compiled. So you don't have to learn any new rake tasks or hook in anything to you know, get all these new front end modules available. It just works. But wait, there's more. You can use Yarn to install NPM packages and then use them in the asset pipeline. What? <laughs> so let, let me let me just let me just kind of break down why this is so exciting. If you are using the asset pipeline, like I'm sure many of you are, and you're using sprockets and you're familiar with how that works, and you're kind of like, do I have to throw all that away and use some webpack thing? And I don't really understand like how that works and blah blah blah. You might not need to do that at all. You can still use Yarn. You can add packages. You can you know, grab jQuery libraries and all this stuff that's on npm now. Um, you know things that you might use Bower. Or, or NPM itself, and use Gulp or on some other you know, project, maybe that's not Rails. Um, you know. Don't worry about all that stuff. You can just install your things, and then the asset pipeline can pick it up without any problem. So this is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, let's look here. We have an application.js manifest. Um, 
pretty standard stuff. We're requiring jQuery, turbolinks, uh, foundation sites. I would wait, what's all this stuff? Yeah, these three lines here, that's coming right out of the node modules folder. So, you know, all the all the places that you'd expect to see JavaScript or style sheets or different things, typically like in you know app slash assets or vendor slash assets. Basically, node modules is just the third path for assets. So all this stuff lives inside of the node modules folder. Um, and yes, this works just as well for your CSS manifest. So you can grab CSS files right out of packages and it works. Uh, so let's 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 uh, talk about sprockets for a moment. Uh, its days are probably numbered. To be honest, you know, it may not be long for this world if we look out over the next few years, because eventually, you know, the, the people are maintaining it are just going to say, why are we maintaining this this whole pipeline when there are you know fully fully JavaScript based pipelines out there that everyone else is using that are all supported and we are supporting them now. So why do we need these two different ways to have, have a pipeline? Um, but that doesn't mean today it's not useful. It doesn't mean today we shouldn't keep using it if it makes sense and we already have projects and it's working. So I feel like you know with this new Yarn integration, being able to load stuff right out of node modules, having that support for the asset pipeline, I feel like that's a, a pretty big deal. So now, now that all that's been said, let's talk about Webpack. It's like magic. Why do I say it's like magic? Because you can do this. I don't know if you can read the text there too clearly, but basically you can say Rails new, blah, 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 and then just say dash dash Webpack equals view, or React, or Angular. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> We'll pretend that that isn't there. <laughs> or you can just say, give me Webpack, but don't pre-install anything. I'll, you know, I'll install whatever I want to install. Uh, or if you have an existing Rails application, you can just put the gem in your gem file, the, the Webpacker gem, and just say, you know, Rails Webpacker install the command line, and poof, get all the, all the boilerplate configuration stuff all set up and ready. Uh, what you get out of the box, um, here's a little tidbit for you. You don't actually need to be on Rails 5.1 to use Webpacker. It supports Rails 4.2 and above. What? <laughs> uh, so I've actually done that. All the work I've done with Webpacker and, and Yarn and all this new stuff has been with Rails 5.1 apps. Um, but you know, if they say it's supported, then, then I believe it. So uh, if you have a Rails 4, uh, code base that you're not ready to upgrade yet, but you want to try out some of this new hotness, you can. As long as you're on Ruby 2.2. Um, so, latest versions of the gem support the latest versions of the, of the Webpack project. Uh, Webpack, in a nutshell, is a way to take a bunch of stuff, do a bunch of transformation and compilation things to them, and then spit it out to another folder somewhere. So, it's kind of a standard concept of a pipeline. Um, if you've used Gulp before, it's kind of like that. Obviously, it's kind of like Sprockets. Um, we won't go too much into the actual you know, mechanics of Webpack itself, but basically, if you're familiar with it or curious about it, you know, the Webpacker integration is a great way to start kicking the tires. Um, so out of the box, yeah, it's supported for ES6 with Babel, uh, code splitting style sheets of all sorts and kinds, images, fonts, CDN support, all these different frameworks like Vue, React, and uh, you get Vue helpers, so um, I'll get to that in a moment. You can do a lot of the same things in Rails views with, with assets from, from the Webpack pipe, uh, pipeline, um, all kinds of configuration stuff. So this is a pretty beefy, pretty neat set of, of things that you get. Everything happens through what are called pack entry points. So you'll have a new top-level app slash JavaScript slash packs. Um, you can configure that differently if you want, but that's the, the default. Uh, and then in there, you can have these sort of top-level JavaScript files. And in, in those top-level JavaScript files, you can import a whole bunch of different things, JavaScript modules and, and 
need another assets like style sheets or images to kind of tie it all into to these packs. Um, you add a tag to your layout. So like in your head, you might say JavaScript pack tag application or some widget, you know, if you have like multiple packs. Um, like I was saying, there, there are view helper tags for things like style sheet pack tags, um, or style sheet uh, files that are in, inside of these folders. Uh, you can load in images um, and other assets through the asset pack pack tag. So this, you know, if you're familiar with how Sprockets works and how you can pull in you know, image assets and things in your views, this will all seem pretty familiar. Uh, here's an example of what a pack a uh, JS file might look like. Uh, you know, we're importing mystyles.scss, icon.png, we're importing Rails unobtrusive JavaScript. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> uh, Turbolinks, um, some boilerplate stuff for stimulus down there. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so, you know, you can have this whole um, set of files in various folders and kind of import all these different things and assemble this pack together. Uh, which brings us to stimulus. Yay! Turbolinks better half. <laughs> uh, you don't have to use Turbolinks and stimulus together. You can use one or you can use the other, but I think using them together actually, like, it's kind of like this quantum leap ahead in all the cool things you can so it's, you know, if you're, you've used Turbolinks a bit, and you're like, well, yeah, this is kind of cool, but it's pretty limited. You know, what do I do when I really want to be able to just click a button and have a thing appear? You know, I don't want to, like, swap out the whole page just for that. Well, enter stimulus. We can use good old Webpacker to load it in. Uh, you can actually say, you know, dash dash Webpack equals stimulus when you create a new Rails project. Or you can add it to an existing gem or sorry, to an existing project just by um, including the web package in. Uh, you basically need a little bit of boilerplate in your application pack. Um, this is it, this is literally all you need. It's kind of just like, you know, copy and paste it off their documentation and you're good to go. Uh, basically what it does is it, it sets up some cool auto-loading magic under the hood. So what you do, what, uh, what you get is you have application slash JavaScript slash controllers. So think of these as front-end controllers, kind of like how you have back-end controllers in your Rails project. Um, and you don't have to like have, you know, like in this file, you don't have to say like import this controller, import that controller, import another controller. It'll just auto-load you know, whatever controller files you have in the JavaScript folder. Right. This is a very simple controller. Um, again, hopefully you can kind of see that back there. Um, we're just importing the controller class from the stimulus library. Um, we're defining a class that extends controller. Um, and um, there's a few kind of methods that you can hook into for the life cycle of one of these controllers. Um, connect is probably the one you'll use the most because that's basically equivalent to document ready in jQuery land. Or you know, basically, whatever your page is initialized and the DOM is ready and JavaScript's ready to do its thing, poof, you get connect, and then you can do whatever you want. In this case, I'm just doing a simple little jQuery plugin thingy, and that's all I need to do in this controller. Uh, in the past, you know, I might have some giant file spaghetti code where like there's like 50 different things that happen on document ready, and somewhere in there there's this call, and you know with the idea of, of stimulus being that you have sort of small defined controllers to handle little bits of things throughout your different screens in your app, um, it makes it nice to, to you know, get this kind of modular approach. Um, and in the, in the view, in the HTML, all you have to do is on a tag, like say a div, just say beta-controller equals and then the name of your controller. So in this case, it's called the read list controller. So we say our controller is read uh, stimulus, basically everything in stimulus revolves around this concept of uh, you have actions and you have targets. So actions flow from the HTML DOM to your controller and targets flow back out to the DOM. So 
Uh, you can think of an action as a method in your controller that you want something in the DOM to, you know, to do based on an event. So if somebody clicks a button, you know, when that click event happens, you want the controller action to handle that click. And then in, in your controller, if you want to reference something in the DOM, like update the value of a form field, or swap out a chunk of HTML in a, in a you know, part of the DOM with some other chunk of HTML, um, use targets for that. Uh, and sometimes it, you know, it might be the same thing. Yeah, it might have a button, like say subscribe, and when you click on it, you want to do something to that button. Like so make it change and say unsubscribe, or maybe you hide it or something. Um, that button could be both an action, you know, have an action on it, and it could also be a target. This is straight from the horse's mouth. This is on the stimulusjs.com, I believe, website. Um, it's probably kind of hard for you to see, but basically, you know, we have a little demo here of, you know, you have a form field and you can type in your name. So I typed in Jared, and I click agree, and then next to it says, hello, Jared. And this all happens on the front end. There's no server side round trip. There's nothing happening in the Rails world. It's just a very simple little bit of stimulus code to handle that clicking the button action, and then uh, the form field that I type my name in is a target, and then there's a span tag that's a second target, and it injects you know, a new string into that span saying hello, and whatever my name was that I typed in. Let's jump into a demo and look at some real world code. So I'll switch over to the web browser here real quick. Here we go. Yeah, all my windows are jumbled around here. One moment. All right, so this is a little side project I've been working on called Posture. Uh, it's basically a RSS news feed reader with some social features to it. Uh, so you can subscribe to feeds, uh, and then when you're browsing through, you can add something to your read list, or you can recommend it, and uh, in, in theory, once that bit's finished, I'm still working on it. Um, somebody who is uh, following you as, as an individual would, would see that you've recommended a particular article with your little comment on it. Um, so we have a bunch of feed items here, um, you know, different button options down here, a little pop-up menu, and I can click on options. Uh, I can add something to my read list. I can go ahead and Recommend this article on the Portland Business Journal. Uh, hit send. And I've actually set up my curator profile. So, a work in progress. But I'm just here to show you how this works under the hood. Uh, one other thing is I'll go over to Discover. And let's see. I haven't actually subscribed to these feeds before, so let me go ahead and add a couple here. And Maybe Ars Technica is too busy of a feed. I don't want it clogging up my, my homepage here. So I'll unsubscribe from them. And come over here. Oh, no, I've changed my mind. I'll go ahead and add it back. Anyway, I'm just doing basic stuff. That's like, you know, every web app has this kind of stuff. But what's cool about this is pretty much all these interactions that you just saw is all happening through stimulus. So let's take a quick look at that. So first of all, uh, clicking add to, to subscribe to a publication, or clicking the button again to unsubscribe from it, uh, that's all happening through a controller here. So we'll go to app, JavaScript, controllers, and we'll go to the subscription controller. And I'll dump up the font size a bunch here. All right. So, uh, so we basically have both two actions and two targets in this controller. We have subscribe, we have unsubscribe. They actually look pretty similar, so in the spirit of DRY, I'll probably create some kind of generic method, and both of these will call that with you know, a different flight set or something. But anyway, we have those two actions. We also have two targets, because we want um, both the subscribe button and the unsubscribe button to be accessible from our controller in order to show one and hide the other, vice versa. Um, so we'll come back to this in just a moment, but I want to show you what the HTML looks like for this. Uh, so I have a little 
little partial here. Yeah, it's loaded in a few different places. Um, so I basically have a subscribe button and an unsubscribe button. That one says add and one says, says added. So that's what you saw a moment ago. Um, and basically all that's happening here is we have um, a data-action attribute here. And it has the name of the controller, pound sign, and then the name of the action. So the name of the controller is subscription. The name of the action is subscribe. So it's subscription, hash sign, subscribe. And we also have it as a target. So it's subscription dot is I'm not sure why, but targets are dots and actions are hashes. So there you go. Subscription dot subscribe. And then same thing out here, subscription and hash unsubscribe, subscription dot unsubscribe for the action and the target. Um, now, just doing this doesn't actually wire this up to a controller. So basically what was happening is this partial is getting called from a couple other places and sort of the wrapper tag around that uh, is defining uh, that, that this is actually supposed to be handed, hand, handled by a specific controller. So we'll come over here to uh, the page that shows a publication lets you subscribe to it. And we'll see here we just have a div tag with data-controller equals subscription, and it renders a partial. And again, just looking at this, I might refactor this so I have the div inside the partial, so I only have to define that controller in, in one spot in the DOM. But I want to show this to illustrate something kind of cool, which is that you can have uh, you know, a chunk of DOM in all kinds of different parts of your application. And as long as you have that data dash controller on that, you know, on the tag for that chunk of HTML, um, that wires up that part of the DOM to the controller. So, um, you know, this kind of allows for thinking of things in terms of components, maybe reusable components. So, you know, it might be, you know, it might have a little bit of a different structure here versus there. But as long as you have certain actions and certain targets available, it will work with the controller. So this is a very flexible system. Uh, let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. Um, so let's pop back over to the browser. Uh, so for each item in, in a feed, um, we can click options over here. And we get this little pop-up menu. It's kind of like a tooltip menu thing. Uh, now here's the interesting thing. That little pop-up gizmo is just a standard jQuery library. Um, I think it's called Web UI Popover or something like that. Um, so totally basic, you know, not part of any framework. It's just it's just one thing and it does it. And so you know, I tried out the demo and I was like, okay, this is exactly what I want. I'll use Yarn, I'll add it in, and away we go. But the difficulty here is in order to get these little links in the menu to do something, um, and it actually isn't doing something because I'm still working on it, but under the hood, I'm, I have an action that's handling this link. And in order to make that work, um, the actual DOM for the tooltip, it's one of those situations where it injects it to like the bottom of body. It's like this other thing way over here. It's totally dynamic and it's like all control for within this widget. So I was trying to think through like, well, how do I handle this? So not a great way to handle it, but essentially what I did is, um, you know, I have a controller that handles each one of these little, you know, feed blocks. So if we go back and look at here, Every single item on a feed is handled by a single controller. And so we have you know, controller, 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 controller all throughout the page. Uh, so when, when any of these controllers first connects to the DOM, you know, on, on a page load, or if it's TurboLinks and you're clicking around, you know, TurboLinks will automatically notify Stimulus, hey, it's, you know, the page has been updated, you know, reconfigure your controllers. So in this connect method, um, one of the things I'm doing is calling a separate method called setup popover. And in setup popover, um, you know, I do this sort of typical looking jQuery block of code where I, you know, I basically, you know, use the options target, well, options button as the bit of DOM I want to work with, and then I 
set up the web UI popover plugin. And when the, when the popover appears, it, it's nice that it provides an on show event. So on show, I you know, grab each one of the little links that's in the menu, and then I call uh, a method that I've defined in my controller. So I'm, I'm trying to keep as much code that does stuff in my controller as standard methods. But you know, because this tool tip is a chunk of DOM that's not controlled by, uh, or not able to be controlled by stimulus, you know, I have to go to this extra step of just setting up these event handlers. So I feel like you know, this is something you you would run into, you know, pretty much with any kind of framework. You know, even if you're in the world of React or Vue, you know, if you're using something like a jQuery plugin, you have to go through some kind of, you know, kind of slightly hacky way of, of wiring these two worlds together. But I felt like the, you know, the way I uh, arrived at this uh, solution here is, is about as clean as we can expect. Uh, and just scrolling down, you know, we, we have lots of nice, you know, fairly small methods in this controller. And the other nice thing is because this is ES6, we're, even though we're in JavaScript land, we have classes, we have methods, you know, we can use the little hash rocket kind of syntax to, to get you know, callbacks where we can still use this. We don't have to have bar underscore self equals this up somewhere and all this other stuff. So you know, this isn't unique to stimulus, of course, but the fact that stimulus sort of is built on and requires all the latest ES6 stuff, it really provides a really nice, clean working environment to, to write these front-end controllers. The last thing I'll show before we, we wrap things up is as I was working on stimulus controllers, I started to think, well, what would a stimulus model look like? Like, what's, what's the model layer? If, if the view is the HTML DOM and we're writing these controllers, what are the models? And so I kind of developed a, a way of thinking about that, which is if, if you have a bunch of code that's essentially kind of going back and forth from the client to the server, in other words, you, you sort of have this persistence layer on your client side. So you want to take incoming data and send it off to the server and then do something when that comes back with a response or whatever. That feels like something that a model should handle. Um, so I created a model called post action. Uh, so coming back here, when I click read list, that basically means I want to save this to my read list. Um, as you can see here, you know, I want to read this later. I don't have time to read this article now, so I'll just go ahead and add it to my read list. Um, so basically, what I have is a controller that handles that click, but then after I've clicked that button, I, it basically calls a model, and that separate model is what actually sends a request to the server. And uh, in this case, I don't really need to process whatever the response is, but I could if I needed to. Um, and the interesting thing is, since stimulus doesn't have some kind of standard way to declare models or, or you, know, you know, you wouldn't subclass anything, um, I, this is just a very standard class. It's a Pojo, plain old JavaScript object. Um, so you know, I have a constructor where I get a couple variables coming in, and then I have a save method and a destroy method, and they're very simple jQuery calls to send some data off to the server. So for my controller, for each one of these uh, feed posts, um, go down here to read, read list. So uh, if my uh, read list button has never been clicked before, I want to add it to my read list. So I create a, a new post action model. Const action equals new post action. Pass it a couple of values, and then I call action.save. And similarly, if I want to take something off the read list, I create a new action, and I call action.destroy. I have a feeling at some point there will be an attempt, either by a third party or by the stimulus people, to come up with some cool sort of active record-ish persistence layer for the client side, uh, and stimulus to be able to you know, hand stuff off to this. Um, but on the other hand, like, a lot of the time, you might not need anything very complicated because a lot of the business logic will be on the on the back end. On the client side, all you really want to do is you know take some stuff and send it off. You know, when there's a response back, you know maybe you put up a little notice or you go to another page or something. So.
So yeah, it's debatable if we need some big huge library on the client side. Um, but at any, any, at any rate, I like the idea of having a clean MVC model view controller paradigm both on the client side and on the server side. So this is the, the pattern that I arrived at. All right, so let's go ahead and get back to our presentation for a quick recap. We've talked about Yarn. It's an awesome front-end package manager. It has a lot of similarities to Bundler. So if you know how to work with Bundler and you like that, and you have often thought to yourself, I wish there was like a Bundler for JavaScript stuff. Well, now there is. <laughs> and we also get the Webpacker Jam, which is actually what you need to get that Yarn integration. Um, and that, uh, that Jam not only works for, for new greenfield projects with Rails 5.1 and above, but uh, it also can be installed to uh, Rails applications going back to 4.2. So that's pretty cool too. And then even more cool is we don't have to abandon the asset pipeline and sprockets. If we don't want to do that, we can use uh, stuff that's been installed into node modules right at the asset pipeline. Um, however, because Webpack is sort of the wave of the future as far as JavaScript and client-side asset uh, pipelines go, um, it's great that we now have full Webpack integration in our Rails applications. Um, it feels like there's a lot of impressive wizardry going under the hood to kind of marry these two worlds together. So I'm, I'm definitely impressed with how it's turned out. Um, and I also feel like, you know, if, if if you are the kind of developer or you have the kind of project where you you resonate with sort of the base camp way of doing things, if you know, if DHH and other people talking about like, you know, let's keep a lot of the logic on the server, but use the client for some cool stuff, some interactive stuff when we need to, um, you know, if that resonates with you, I feel like stimulus is a really cool front end library that can kind of get you to that, you know, 80% of the way to getting all the slick modern web app that you want uh, with a lot less effort than if you, you know, fully adopted something like Vue or React or, or even a bigger project that you would have to do with, say, Angular or Ember. That's all, folks. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow.
Um, so, so yes, we're kind of at the point where the question becomes like, well, do you use the jam or do you use something else? And so I think the answer at this point is pretty clearly, yeah, you use something else. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend finding and using gems for adding front-end assets. I think you know, the default position at this point should be you know, use, use Yarn, um, you know, find, find the package name, whatever it's called, Yarn Add, and then with the Webpacker gem, you get to use that you know, with sprockets and the asset pipeline, um, but it's installed into the Node Modules folder. And so the nice thing there is, you know, anytime there's a new release of, of JavaScript or CSS or whatever it is, and that package is updated, you, know, you can immediately have access to that base update. So, big win there. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, one of the biggest issues I've had using Webpack with Rails is when I'm actively developing an engine. Have you been able to use Webpacker to use engine assets successfully? Um, I don't believe I've done that. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked with engines and, and have, you know, of course, loaded in assets and sprockets from the engines. Um, but uh, no, I haven't done it through the Webpack channel. So um, yeah, there, there might be a bit of a pain point there. Hopefully, hopefully they're working on that. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's say you have an app and it's grown, it's large, and you want to separate the front end and the back end. Does it provide a way to eject the front end from the repo and like deploy it as its own service? Is that possible? Um, I would say a lot, of, a lot of the tooling and sort of process stuff I've covered sort of assumes that you're in a Rails monolith context. Um, you know, if you're using Rails just for API and you have a separate front end, um, obviously you would most likely be using Webpack, you can use Stimulus, you know, you can use all the things that are available, um, but it would be, you know, it would be a different process. You'd have two different code bases, of course. Um, you know, the, the, the nice thing about the monolith approach, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, is you can do things like, you know, say, you know, Rails assets pre-compile, and you know, everything's compiled, and it just rolls out at the same time you're deploying your Rails app. You know, if you have two different code bases, you know, you have to have two different deployments, you have to have two different, you know, not necessarily two different servers, but certainly two different setups within a server to, to handle, you know, both the separate back end and the front end. So, um, so not a whole lot of what I talked about is directly applicable in terms of the process, but in terms of the packages and stimulus and things that Webpack can do, you know, obviously you can do all that in a, in a purely front end context. You mentioned, you know, uh, per particular DOM portion, you always copy a controller, right? And the controller listens to the methods. What if you know the same DOM element wants to talk to two different controllers? Um, so you can have nested controllers. So if you have like a big wad of code, you know, like a big widget on your page that is, is a controller, but you have like some sub widgets, I guess you could say, um, those could be other controllers. And so then you have kind of a parent child hierarchy. Um, I think one issue I've seen on the stimulus forum that people have kind of wrangled with is what if you have controller A on the page that wants to directly talk to controller B on the page, but you know they're not coupled or connected in any way you know, automatically. How do you do that? And so, um, you know, so people have come up with ways to do that, but um, kind of feels like a bit of a workaround right now. So I would say, um, for what I understand, like that sort of uh, you know, controllers talking to other controllers and having that kind of interface going on is, is seems like something that's in the works right now. But there's not like the one sanctioned way to do it. Also, you mentioned you know the front end calling APIs, right? So what if my API generates a let's say I have a table and I've added a new row, which should reflect on the UI right away. 
So I am from the React world. So whatever I do, I have cater that are subscribed to the changes in the store. So do we have such mechanism in you know, Ruby? Or um, see, if I, if I, if I think I get yeah, what you're saying, it's that you know if, if you do something to update the DOM to to add like a new table row. Will that new table roll row then like get a new controller attached to it if each row is being handled by a controller? And I think the answer is yes, because stimulus uh, under the hood uses uh, what's it called mutation observer. Um, so you know every time the DOM is updating in the browser, like it it's directly sending these sort of events out to whatever's hooked into that. So stimulus is hooked into that. So if, if all of a sudden, like no matter where it comes from, if all of a sudden there's a new DOM new, and it has data dash controller on it, stimulus automatically picks that up. It's gonna then connect something. Um, so so it's it's a bit reactive. Um, but you know it, it, it certainly stimulus doesn't do what people typically you know look to react or something like that to do, which is that you know essentially have a you know the JSON data structure somewhere and when you update that, DOM things just automatically automatically update. In stimulus, you have to have some kind of you know, render code to you know, maybe update the value of something or, um, or you know, grab a chunk of code. You, you could use a service, uh, sorry, a client-side template. You, know, you could have some kind of whatever your client-side template, templating language of choice is. You could you know, call render out to that and then whatever HTML produces, you know, the stimulus controller could do something with that. But stimulus, it, it tries to stay in a very sort of thin slice of your app, which is like, grab events out of the DOM, put stuff back in the DOM, and whatever that stuff is you want to put in the DOM, it's kind of up, for, uh, up to you to decide how you want to handle that. And I, for some people, that might seem too limited, but for me, I feel like, you know, this sort of layer is where so much jQuery spaghetti code and other just weird stuff happens in so many projects, and we're trying to get away from that. So I think stimulus solves like a big problem that a lot of people run into you know, right away when they're working on a web app. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.